Hi, everyone. Thanks for making it to our third morning or third afternoon. Sorry, I, I'm getting confused because uh, at least two of our speakers today are up at the very crack of dawn <laughs> to be here with us, which is really great. And um, I'm really glad as well to see everybody else here. So this is um, panel eight and it is on representations of masculinity. We have um, three papers um, and we'll take them in order and, and we'll do um, a short question and answer at the end of each paper uh, and then we can maybe have some time if people have other questions they want to ask at the end that we kind of roll up everybody's um, presentations. So um, our first presenter is Lisa Saliki, who is at the University of Athens. The, um, and uh, she is going to be talking on Regency masculinity in 21st century Shondaland, male erotic desire and racial tropes in Bridgerton. I'm really looking forward to this. So over to you, Lisa. Thank you. Make sure you unmute. You need to unmute, yeah. I did to uh, uh, unmute, but then I was uh, 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 unmuting myself again. So uh, thank you, Clarissa. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let me start with a warning uh, that this is not a, a formal paper. Uh, so I'm not sharing screen. I'm just uh, going to share my thoughts and air my uh, thoughts um, uh, with you. So please consider it as a work in progress. Uh, and um, I, I'm not sure how close I am to what I, uh, I promised to deliver, uh, but thankfully I will be quite uh, brief and, 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 and short. Um, so um, Bridgerton was an instant hit, uh, even in Greece, uh, which was, uh, uh, it, it was one of the top five uh, uh, shows, uh, most popular shows on Netflix on Christmas uh, 2020. Uh, I suppose the combination of anachronistic spectacle of exuberant costumes and uh, naked flesh, uh, including an impressive amount of male bottom uh, in the uh, opening three minutes, uh, as well as an uncomplicated soap operatic romance uh, and all that happening amidst uh, COVID uh, lockdown uh, did offer audiences uh, a no-nonsense um, diverted mode. Um, however, following its, uh, its release, a huge debate uh, erupted. Uh, regarding the show's potential for subversion and, and creativity, uh, especially at, as it concerns post-racial politics and its, um, let's call it feminist, uh, in inverting commas or without, feminist take on, on costume um, drama. So, um, in a nutshell, um, Bridgerton is one uh, of Shonda Land's uh, uh, latest uh, creation. Uh, uh, Shonda Rhimes, uh, producer Shonda Rhimes, is uh, renowned for uh, uh, having a, a systematically having a colorblind casting uh, strategy. And we've seen that in, um, I think, all of Shonda's uh, productions, including Grey's Anatomy, uh, Scandal, um, uh, For the People, uh, Private Practice, everywhere we uh, see a, a systematic inclusion uh, of, um, of people of, of color. Um, so as spirit pieces go, um, Bridgerton has been seen as offering a new take on the genre, the costume drama, uh, mainly through the way people of color um, have been uh, um, a part of the story. Um, now, whether or not that uh, um, uh, can be seen as something revolutionary and as opening, you know, uh, a, a new ground for um, representation of uh, of male protagonists and especially of, of people of color, uh, of of of, uh, of black protagonists. Uh, I think has to be uh, problematized. Um, the greatest, uh, I think, uh, problem ha has been what has been um, hailed as a very 
superficial and uh, um, uh, in some accounts, uh, by the way, uh, the, the show has uh, uh, represents in a very plastic way. Uh, Kristen uh, Walker talks about uh, plastic representation and think plastic representation of um, uh, the Duke of Hastings, Simon, uh, the uh, hotter Duke. Um, um, <laughs> the way his uh, maleness uh, and his sexuality is being uh, represented is, uh, is, is quite superficial and, and shallow. Uh, many people um, point towards uh, the inclusion of male protagonists uh, and how good this is in terms of employment and opportunities given to um, uh, through casting, uh, through uh, uh, lead actors, uh, male and female, of course, as well as uh, people working in production. Uh, so I think this is a good thing, but I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm dubious of the way this actually um, um, uh, can be, uh, can count as uh, subversive and, and revolutionary uh, in terms of representation. Um, we can say, I think, okay, uh, so um, male nakedness and male sexuality has been uh, put out as a spectacle. Uh, so the notion of Steve Neal's uh, you know, uh, masculinity as spectacle um, is, well, a good thing uh, to begin with, uh, in the sense that um, uh, Male protagonist, particularly um, uh, the black protagonist, uh, is uh, you know is the object of desire, uh, same way as uh, women have been the object of desire uh, across uh, film and uh, and on television. Uh, so I'll give you know I'll tick uh, a partial you know uh, box of um, uh, of subvertiveness in, in this respect, um, but. Whether or not this uh, actually um, changes uh, the game for um, it, it's a, it's a game changer, yes, for uh, for for black protagonists, uh, I'm quite uh, skeptical, and um, I would uh, uh, offer um, to you uh, that I uh, agree with a large part of. Uh, um, uh, criticism that sees the show as uh, basically creating a colonial imperial uh, costume drama um, dressed in uh, in black and white offering uh, black people uh, positions of power uh, which okay um, uh, historically speaking uh, has some uh, credibility um, and we know that from a number of uh, historical reviews uh, which have um, pointed out the number of black people living in London uh, in Regency, um, at Regency times, uh, including both paupers and uh, princes and you know, our elite aristocracy. Um, but the way um, um, particularly male protagonists are uh, being represented in Bridgerton um, uh, is just a camouflage uh, uh, for whiteness. So what we're seeing in Bridgerton is um, um, uh, particularly the uh, hot duke, uh, uh, Simon, um, Roger Jean uh, uh, Page, uh, being represented as uh, a, a white male. So, you know, he's, he's being He's a black, but playing uh, um, uh, the dominant role of white patriarchy, because overall, uh, what Bridgerton is about uh, is um, a masculinity in terms of uh, heteronormative culture, where um, uh, the uh, um, uh, the man has to uh, initiate. Um, the flawless uh, virgin uh, woman into sexuality and you know show her uh, talk her and, and and guide her through the tropes uh, the end um, uh, uh, goal being uh, having babies because everything about uh, Bridget well uh, season one of Bridget is about uh, you know whether or not uh, uh, Simon will pass on his seed uh, to dear Daphne, uh, to Lily White Daphne, uh, or not. Um, so overall, although I started watching Bridgerton um, uh, and was indeed mesmerized by uh, the costumes and the opulence and uh, you know the exuberance of the production, 
uh, as it progressed, I became increasingly worried and uh, disillusioned. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll stop here because I said, you know, this is not a written paper. This is just uh, uh, my thoughts uh, um, uh, and and uh, uh, my way of testing these thoughts uh, with you all. And thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So <laughs> I put my camera back on and then didn't think to put the microphone back on. I'm sorry about that. So um, yeah, uh, thank you very much, Lisa, for, for uh, going through some of those really interesting problematics around Bridgerton. Uh, would anybody like to ask a question um, before I might claim uh, Speakers, um, not speakers, chairs, prerogative. Anyone? No. Well, then I'm I'm going to ask you a question, Lisa, if I may. Um, I know that I think you opened up a number of those questions that have kind of circulated in uh, academic and also in media circles around. Uh, you know, is Bridgerton colonial? Is it not? Is it simply escape of its fantasy? And I wondered whether you had any sense of how viewers themselves might have viewed the series and its representations of masculinity, because for sure the Duke um, has, uh, has become a kind of ideal type, ideal hero for many, I think, but uh, or, or at least within journalistic accounts that he he has become that but I wondered whether or not you thought about any kinds of research with audience members well I've uh, I've seen um, uh, a number of uh, audience reviews uh, uh, in in various sites and and you can see you know there's um, uh, a pendulum between those uh, uh, members of the audience who loved it and um, uh, were uh, simply carried away uh, by the narrative and uh, by the escapism it offers. And it is a beautiful production. It has uh, beautiful, sexy people and, you know, nice, tight, you know, male, uh, male bottoms to look at, uh, both uh, black and, and, and white. Um, and it is, as every other uh, Shonda land uh, production, it is, uh, you know, high standard production. Uh, it, it does what it promises in the sense of, you know, this is a steamy show and uh, Shonda knows how to, to do this, uh, offer um, soap operatic, uh, so, you know, a good romance uh, within a particular setting. So now she, she's launched herself into historical drama. She plays with this kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, historicity and, uh, you know, anachronistic um, uh, reinvention of, um, you know, times past. Um, so that, that, that's all good, but um, we shouldn't forget that uh, Roger uh, Jean uh, Page, you know, he's a British Zimbabwean, uh, but he is, uh, you know, this is where colorism um, uh, comes in, you know, he's very close to what we, you know, white audiences consider, you know, good looking because he's, um, uh, his characteristics are quite Caucasian, uh, so he, he is a dark skinned, not, not too dark, uh, you know, so he has a, um, a, a light dark complexion uh, and that comes in a very nice, you know, wrapping. Uh, so he's, uh, he's good looking, uh, he's not fretting in the sense, you know, he's not too dark. Uh, therefore, um, uh, large audiences, white audiences, you know, can identify with him and uh, think of him as, you know, their object of desire. Uh, I wonder if that would be the case if we had a, a more, um, a, a, a darker, uh, and no, not not so uh, Caucasian European, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, a male lead. Were we, you know, going to feel the same? I wonder. Would uh, you know people in the audience um, be so enthralled with him? I'm not so sure. Then there are also uh, members of the audience who uh, can see through um, um, uh, the production, and they say, well. You know, this is like, you know, Teflon, uh, you know, it doesn't go through the surface uh, a number. Well, I haven't checked, but 
I could, uh, you know, I, I would bet that um, uh, the most uh, uh, strict critique comes from uh, black uh, audiences uh, who think that, okay, well, uh, just the fact that you put some uh, black people um, into nice costumes and, uh, you know, uh, pretend to be aristocracy uh, does not uh, negate the fact that that was um, uh, when colonialism took place. This, this is an imperialist uh, narrative. Uh, and, um, you know, there, there, there are still people in the background, uh, servants and, uh, you know, everybody else who, you know, makes this world in Regency London uh, work, you know, uh, those are people from the colonies. So again, you still have a quite um, a, a race a, a, a race um, uh, sensitive um, uh, backdrop and, and we shouldn't forget that. Uh, having said that, I think it would be interesting to do a, you know, a comparative audience research um, uh, you know, into a number of countries where uh, the show has, has played to see how you know, actually people, you know, what actually people think. Mm. Yeah, great. I can see that Jose has a his hand up. Um, so if you'd like to come in, Jose, and ask a question. Yes, um, I, I uh, thank you. Um, I, my own experience of watching the show was that there was a, a real difference between people who were reading the program in relation to uh, a perceived historical reality, people who were reading it in relation to notions of blind casting. And personally, I think it would be wrong to think of Shondaland productions as blind casting. I think they're very actively cast in relation to color. And then the third rubric was actually Shondaland productions herself. Yeah, itself. Because, I mean, it's hard to imagine now, but, you know, Scandal was the first hour long production focused on a black woman in American television. I mean, that, that's just yesterday, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there are all of these historical gains uh, made, you know, through uh, her and her production company that, uh, you know, has really kind of altered the realm of the possible in American television. So I just wondered if you had any views on, you know, kind of how reading through Shondaland might change or alter reading through other categories of this work, if that makes well sense. Uh, yeah, it does make sense. Uh, well, I think that, um, well, as you um, um, uh, rightly said, you know, um, uh, Shondarams has changed the uh, level of uh, employability and, you know, the, the connection of, uh, you know, the industry and, and representation. So um, uh, she has, uh, you know, stirred the ground. Uh, I think we should be looking at uh, Shonda Rhimes as a, a genre uh, in itself. Like, you know, um, there was a, just a while ago, there was a call for papers for um, the production of uh, um, uh, Murphy and uh, uh, the American Horror Story uh, um, um, uh, production and um, uh, in, in their universe. Uh, uh, now I've blocked out, I can't remember the names. And, and I think we, as scholars, you know, it's worth looking at uh, Shonda Rhimes as a universe. So, you know, Shonda Rhimes production and let's, uh, you know, do a textual analysis, let's do audience research, let's do how, uh, let's see um, how she has changed uh, the, uh, uh, the industry. Um, uh, I think she has become a media phenomenon in, in herself and, and, uh, and that uh, should um, merit academic attention. Um, and uh, that, that's all I have to say. I, anything else, it's uh, pure speculation uh, because right. nobody has uh, actually studied it. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, I think... Um... We'll move on to our second speaker now, and um, and we may return to some of these issues with you, Lisa, uh, as as the session goes on. So um, our second speaker is Gilad Padva, uh, who is at Tel Aviv um, University, and he's going to be talking on screening monstrous masculinities. So thank you very much, Gilad. Thank you, Clarissa, and uh, Shalom. Thanks for this very, very lovely conference. I enjoy it a lot. So 
Um, I'll just uh, share my screen, of course. Oh, can you please able sharing screen? It's enabled. Oh, oh okay, very good. So I try, yes, very good. Yes. That's it, okay. So William Friedkin's controversial American horror film, Cruising, United States, 1980, centers on an undercover straight policeman in New York City who tries to track down a serial killer in gay leather bars. The young officer, Steve Burns, Al Pacino, of course, goes undercover and tries to attract the murderer. He pretends to be Tom Ford, a gay resident in the Greenwich Village. He begins to integrate in New York's leather bars, whereas the murderer continues to pick up his victims in cruising areas of Central Park, where people are looking for uh, outdoor sex, and at the uh, West Village sex clubs in Manhattan. Notably, cruising branched up uh, from the from the underground, uh, the sadomasochistic demimond of gay leather scene that has not been seen in mainstream cinema before. But there are many problems because this film sensationally reinscribes a perverting pedagogy that includes merciless stereotyping, homophobia, and pathologization of homosexuality. This film predominantly markets gay masculinity as otherness and its intimidating exoticism. Arguably, the film Cruising misrepresents queerness as one of the biggest and most terrifying threats to the American law and order and conservative values. This cinematic backlash in its heterosexist manner essentializes so-called authentic gayness and it uh, recovers the power of patriarchy and the extremely brutal, monstrous policemen from the threat, so-called, of post-Stonewall gay rights movement. Many straits, or at least William Friedkin felt threatened, I suppose. So conspicuously, gayness is connoted in this film with ruthless hyper-masculinities, fetishized machismo, perverted brutality, monstrous sadism, grotesque masochism, and uninhibited phallic, phallic instincts. This is particularly evident in a murderer's stabbing scene in a peep show booth in which the slashed victim's blood is sprayed on a screen where a gay porphyn is shown. The result is a nightmarish montage or superimposition of the knife and then imagined erection, stabbing, and fucking. Eros and Thanatos and anal pleasure, which is equalized in this, uh, by this montage with brutal death. The performative masculinities, both gay sadomasochistic masculinities and NYPDs, homophobic straight masculinities in cruising, also perilously demonstrate the intricate interrelations between Carnival and Carnival, Baudrillard 2011. Cruising is carnivalesque in its role playing, theatrical rituals and ritualistic theatricality. It is also metaphorically cannibalistic because it compulsively consumes gay men who are serially killed or rather sacrificed for the straight viewers' satisfying exploration of Leatherland. Um, before the policeman goes to the subcultural venue, he is carefully dressing up, meticulously wearing the sadomasochistic gay subcultures, accoutrements, and regalia. The deployment of signifiers of rough yet ritualistic masculinity produces him as a campy, drug macho, I would say, who is theatrically demonized and demonically theatricalized. Burns' somewhat neurotically preparation draws morbid attention to Burns' attractive young male body and uh, this deceiver's readiness for stimulating interaction with the licentious men. The atmosphere at the perilous clubs is exciting and mysterious. 
the pleasure is too important to be surrendered or repressed. In retrospect, Cruz's cinematic cabinet of curiosities reflects Friedkin's ambition to assemble a shocking microcosm of an unknown scary world. Historically, the content of cabinets of curiosities in general came to form a theatrum mundi, sort of theatrical world. In this case, the cabinet of sadomasochistic gay curiosities is governed by conspicuously commercial principles that organize and map the gay letter scene, labyrinths of desperate gravity and horrendously dangerous same-sex bacchanalia. Indifferent to his detractors, however, Friedkin's practice of collecting visceral curiosities, to put it this way, is central to the straight world's post Stonewall epistem, or homophobic epistem, I would say. Uh, this screen of monstrous masculinist transformations oscillates between disguise and disgust, and it horrifically blurs the boundaries between them in its presentation of the detective's monstrous performances. Um, Peter Platt, 1999, notes that, I quote, the marvelous and the monstrous are almost always in danger of eluding mastery and classification. Yet it is this very intractability that can force or facilitate a recharting of the map of artistic possibility, of the body, of the known world, or human potential, end of quote. In the popular cultural imagination, however, um, the marvelous and the monstrous are often connoted with spectacular disguise and horrendous disgust. Notably, the film Cruising can be easily regarded as a disgusting film with its multiple unbearable sides, from atrocious killings to ostentatious spectacles of helpless victims crying for help when the cold-hearted murderer rapes them and stabs their backs, from mutilated bodies and floating body parts to bleeding beds, walls, and floors, and Cruising's notorious portraying of gay sadomasochistic practitioners as animalistic, obsessive, repulsive, and possessed perverts who cannot change their deadly habits. Cruising, with its notorious abundance of homoerotic spectacles and sex scenes, including aforementioned ex excerpts from a gay porn film that depicts anal penetration, however, aims to provoke significant anger, fear, and disgust among its straight clientele. The heteronormative spectators are expected to be repulsed by the specters of consensual anal and oral sex between men, not only by conspicuously brutal sadomasochistic scenes and sex crimes. In a significant scene, the detectives secretly listen to a sexual encounter between Burns, Al Pacino, and a gay guy named Skip. They realize that Skip is about to tie up their colleague. The detectives dramatically break into the room and untie Skip's hands while he lies naked on the bed, exposing his shapely smooth buttocks. Steve, who doesn't look upset by the sadomasochistic ritual, is angry at his counterparts who invaded the room at the wrong moment. Steve's reaction indicates that he is more than disappointed that the cops disrupted his intimacy with Pete. His anger does not necessarily derive from the policeman's breaking before he could prove that Skip is the serial killer. Rather, he seems upset because he liked what he did with the other guy. In closing phobic eyes, homophobic eyes, I would say, to get from so-called heteronormative inquiry of the sodomites to so-called sodomy itself, you have to cross several lines. You cross from legitimate to pervert. You cross from social to corporeal. You cross from civilization to barbarity. And you cross from policing observation to licentious participation. Um, 
this uncovered policeman often admits that his transgressive gay masquerade affects him. Whenever he needs to reveal, to, re, to revalidate uh, his straightness, he passionately and often aggressively makes love to his devoted girlfriend, Nancy. This routine is not surprising considering the role of Steve Burns as an agent of the straight viewers who colonialistically explore unknown queer nativities. Nevertheless, Steve and Nancy's intense sexual intercourse also embodies the tragedy of homosexuality, Jane Ward, 2020, a sexuality that too often integrates romantic attraction and patriarchal oppression, glorious lustfulness, and dreadful misogyny. Yet the man-woman sex scenes in cruising are presented as precious moments of heteronormalcy in a sort of devastating gay inferno. Near the end of the film, however, Nancy, the alibi for, for Steve Derm's straightness, pretends to be a gay letterman herself, possibly even the gay serial killer. At the beginning of Nancy's hypermasculine masquerade, Steve shaves at the bedroom while his girlfriend looks with great interest at a leather biker cap decorated by a sort of quasi-Nazi silver hope. The young woman puts on the sunglasses and wears the leather pants. There is a cut to Burns finishing shaving. He mixes himself with the razor and flinches. A cheerful, playful music is sound when the woman wears the leather jacket that hides the upper part of her white dress. This scene ends up ends by a close-up on Steve's face when he gazes into the camera in a shot that possibly indicates his fear that Nancy, the straight woman, might be the serial gay male killer. The close-up of Burns' face dissolves to a shot of a river trawler crossing this, the screen on the Hudson River, recalling the discovery of an amputated, amputated arm in the opening scene of this film. So it's circular in a way. And uh, Guy Davidson, Guy Davidson, 2005, suggests that with this edit, cruising the film concludes that there is a possibility that Burns has become infected, so-called, with both homosexual desire and the desire to kill through his interactions with the gay world. The aspect of the film that most outraged, outraged the um, gay uh, activists against this uh, film. Raising the possibility that gay serial killer, the gay serial killer is Steve or his girlfriend, acknowledges the masculine monster within who could erupt at any moment with uh, its uh, aberrant sexual identity. This is a multidirectional, inward and back and outward awareness of an inherent masculine monstrosity that necessitates social and self-control and remediation and remediation of inner sexual conflicts. Whether cruising highlights the indeterminacy and invisibility of sexual identity or rather emphasizes a dichotomous sexual regime, this film claims that not only sexual masquerade but also the authentic, so-called authentic sexual identity comprises perilous uncertainties about the totality and purity of one's sexuality. Thus, homosexual masquerade is never one-dimensional or strictly limited to external features and theatrical mannerisms. Living a condition of straight skin, gay mask, requires constant re-examination of the borders between mainstream and counter-cultural masculinities. Monstrous hypermasculine pretense requires dynamic re-evaluation of the power relations and the symbiosis between the visible and the obscured in order not to be exposed. Such intimate examination and re-evaluation, however, often involves 
blur boundaries between masquerade and authenticity and possible diffusion of the staged queer hypermasculine identity into one's masculinist reality. Thank you. Thank you. That was really fascinating. I'm going to have to go back and watch that film again, actually. Uh, it's such a long time since I last saw it. Um, I, can see, I, I can see that Jason um, has made a comment in the uh, chat. So I wonder if you'd like to ask that question as our first one, Jason. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <clears throat> I'm eating my lunch. Um, yeah, I didn't mean to necessarily ask the question. Just interesting that um, Hollywood seems not to have moved on from this. Um, I'm thinking of Silence of the Lambs, you know, which was the Oscar award winner, I think, in 1990 or 91. But again, both of the main serial killers had this sort of um, sadomasochistic side to them which was which was associated with homosexuality in one way or the other and uh, you know hollywood's uh, homophobia has certainly been been brought into attention much more recently than that as well so i guess if i had a question it is how embedded is this in in sort of mainstream film industry and, and why does this trope continue to replicate sort of decade upon decade given that cruising is now you know, 40 years plus in, in, in the past. Yes, thanks for this very, very ex good question. Um, I think that uh, um, in the uh, homophobic straight mind, uh, homosexuality is uh, a perversion and uh, a very intimidating perversion uh, because of its um, Invisibility. I mean, most uh, gay men and women and bisexuals um, uh, cannot be identified as such uh, uh, if they do not uh, admit uh, to be or, or say or uh, openly uh, gays and lesbians. So I think that um, the invisibility is uh, very threatening, and uh, of course. Uh, uh, Homophobia is uh, interconnected in many ways, I believe, uh, with um, colonialism, of course. And uh, we know uh, Chauvin Somerville's excellent film, uh, Coloring the Line, uh, about the connection between racism and homophobia in American history. It's a fascinating book. And some under a uh, very, very uh, interest, interesting scholarship about uh, this, uh, inter these interrelations. So uh, I think that, uh, and also, um, uh, of course, uh, I was thinking about Silence of the Lambs, of course, uh, where the murderer is uh, a transgender person, and uh, about uh, the true story of, I think, an uh, Austrian uh, serial, serial killer uh, who is gay and serial killer and the uh, ate his victims. So uh, I think it's uh, very fascinating uh, for the uh, uh, homophobic imagination uh, because uh, in a way, maybe uh, it uh, turns uh, homosexuality into uh, a total uh, perversi perversity, uh, not uh, a perversity in certain aspects, but uh, the totality of being a a sort of a full-time pervert, I would say, a uh, cannibal and uh, um, and uh, a, a predator and uh, a pedophile, etc., etc., etc. So being can a cannibal, it's just uh, put it, it just completes the picture, you know. So uh, I think uh, it's something about uh, that. And uh, one more, and I'm so so grateful for this wonderful question because it makes me think that. Uh, Maybe it's also because um, the, uh, um, the uh, corporeal image, uh, the lustful image of homosexuality in a popular culture, in mainstream popular culture, uh, usually um, a gay men, I think much more than a gay women, uh, stuff, uh, gay men are uh, connoted in the straight imagination with lustfulness, 
uh, with uh, promiscuity, uh, etc. So uh, with uh, greed and uh, being uh, cannibalistic, it's a, a, another aspect of a, of a greed in a way, uh, and uh, and obsession and obsessions and uh, and um, being a, a sort of as I uh, called it a, a possessed pervert. Uh, also pervert, but uh, possessed uh, not only by uh, uh, his uh, uh, sexual desire, but also by his by his uh, culinary desire in a way. So uh, I think that uh, it just uh, proves that uh, it, it, on one hand, uh, Hollywood made a, a very, very big way uh, since the very uh, homophobic uh, 60s, for example. But on the other hand, uh, Hollywood is uh, still extremely homophobic. And um, even uh, um, um, so-called uh, or so-called gay-friendly uh, TV shows, uh, uh, TV series uh, like Ratchet, for example, are not totally uh, free of some, I would say, I felt some at times that it, it is more than a bit homophobic, I would say, at least some of the uh, cliches in uh, Ratchet, which is an, a beautiful, spectacular uh, TV series, but uh, I think that um, uh, still um, uh, it's uh, quite rare to, to find uh, TV series that truly and, uh, and uh, honestly uh, equalize all sexual tendencies, all sexuality. And uh, there's still a long way to go till uh, we reach uh, this uh, point. Thank you. Um, we have two hands up. Jose, were you asking a question or did you just have your hand up from the last time? No, I have a question. Oh, great. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I met my first uh, long-term boyfriend when he was leading a picket line on the film and I was crossing it to watch that film. And I wondered, I mean, it's a film that has always had that uh, uh, um, problematic lure, <laughs> yeah, and has been very much reclaimed by younger generations of, of queer scholars in particular, not only, uh, you know, for a, a kind of a history of evokes, it was shot in real clubs and so on, uh, but also for the way that it speaks of, uh, I suppose, you know, transgressive desire, right? And I just wondered if, if you could say something about that, you know, the reclaiming. Thank you so much, uh, and uh, I, I can't stop myself as to say that uh, I truly love your uh, wonderful research, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor for me. So um, I think that the, this uh, reclaiming is very problematic. I uh, took part in the uh, SCMS conference a few years ago, where the uh, dedicated uh, whole panel to closing and this uh, controversy and many, and I think that uh, all the participants actually reclaim this film and uh, even praise this film for its uh, campiness, for its theatricality. And um, maybe I, I can explain my own point of view about this uh, reclaiming by mentioning an uh, Israeli uh, um, painter of Jewish Russian um, uh, origins. Uh, uh, she uh, created a series of uh, figurines uh, according to the most anti-Semitic, the Stürmer, all this uh, uh, Nazi stuff. Uh, she created uh, some uh, very camp, so-called campy uh, and anti-Semitic anti figurines. And uh, I should admit that I feel uh, I, I'm not at ease with such a project or such a reclaiming. Of course, this uh, wonderful uh, painter, uh, Zora Cherkasky, she didn't mean to be anti-Semitic, that's for sure. But uh, she did want it to paradise, in a way, these uh, powerful anti-Semitic uh, images. And I don't think that at least most of the uh, young generation, of the young uh, gay men who, or, or, who claim this film are uh, self-homophobic. I don't think so. But I think that uh, um, 
it's a sort of, uh, it's, it's always about the context. Nowadays, they feel comfortable enough to reclaim this film. But uh, at that very particular historic moment, closing uh, was very defamatory, very, very harmful, and, uh, and very problematic because uh, there are hardly any other uh, um, um, gay uh, or, or um, straight mainstream films who concentrated on gay themes. It was one of the very few films who dealt with, uh, with uh, gay issues. And uh, I feel it, I think it's uh, maybe still the only uh, mainstream film I know that uh, deals with uh, um, BDSM, with gay BDSM. It's very, very difficult to find other films. So I can see why they appreciate it so much. And one of the main uh, arguments of um, this, uh, um, these colleagues who, who uh, now like cruising a lot is that uh, they are uh, BDSM practitioners themselves, and they feel that this film speaks in their language, and uh, all these uh, atrocious uh, killings are uh, so uh, so so ridiculous that it's so so campy, and the campiness uh, neutralizes the homophobic tone of this film. I don't buy it. I don't think. I don't. I disagree with them. And uh, we agreed to disagree in a way. I think that uh, this film is still extremely homophobic. And um, I think it's very interesting, uh, for example, uh, to make, uh, to compare between uh, cruising and uh, for example, um, for example, I think about uh, Lady Gaga's uh, music video, Alejandro. And uh, Alejandro also, uh, in a way, uh, uh, makes, uh, she, she is queering uh, sadomasochism in a way and uh, many uh, Christian rituals and uh, symbolism and uh, symbols, of course. And uh, I think um, the sort of, uh, make, of, of uh, making the uh, gay BDSM uh, uh, fashionable it's always uh, double-edged, and uh, Chuck Lynans uh, wrote about the talking about cannibalism. He said that uh, all these advertisers uh, use uh, uh, their uh, uh, their exper experiences from uh, the weekend they spend at the subculture uh, in order to uh, to bring something new to their new campaigns. So actually, it's always as they say that it is sort of a cannibalism of uh, of a cannibalizing uh, countercultures. So I think uh, uh, maybe we can also speak about uh, sort of self cannibalizing uh, subcultures in a way. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, so Peter, would you like to ask your question and? Yes, thank you, and uh, thank you for that uh, presentation. Um, my, my question was actually very similar to Jose's question. I was uh, I was wondering about you know what you think about the potentials for a queer counter reading of that movie, which you've already answered. Although I was not so much interested in the question of uh, camp and uh, parody. And and by the way, I think everything you say is is true. <laughs> I think you're absolutely right, and I agree with the homophobic construction intent especially if you contextualize it historically. And I also think it's really important to, uh, you know, to be reminded of that and not um, just uh, use it as some sort of like free floating uh, assemblage of signs that we can, you know, uh, reconstruct and uh, so on and so forth. However, I think there's something about, let's just say queer pleasure in this movie, you know, and you, you talked about the docu documentary value, that's true, but there's also something about the dancing scene and, you know, some of the clips that you showed us that are really, really hot, <laughs> you know, or for some people. And, um, and, you know, let's just say from a perspective of, uh, uh, 2021 uh, from a sometimes very sanitized uh, queer cosmos, <laughs> these very raunchy sex scenes seem very hot and have a lot to do with queer pleasure and queer desire. So I wonder whether, you know, after everything you've said, there's still some place in your argument to, uh, to acknowledge the value of, of that. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, thanks. And uh, this is why I uh, stressed uh, the, uh, about uh, the um, pleasure of Steve Burns, detective Al Pacino. 
he enjoys being, oh, actually uh, uh, he is not a uh, 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 fact on screen, but uh, he, he yearns to be fucked. And, uh, uh, and this uh, scene that I talked about uh, when, when the detectives uh, break into the room uh, proves it. He's very, he's mad at them. Why did you interrupt me? I wanted to uh, frame uh, the serial killer, etc. cetera. And uh, I, uh, what is really fascinating, I think, and, and I, know, I, I know that uh, um, it supports the uh, reclaimers of this uh, film uh, in a way, is the uh, transgressive enjoyment of, uh, of, this, of Steve Burns. Because I do think that uh, William Friedkin uh, uh, meant to make a homophobic film, although he totally denies it. And he published a, a disclaimer that, uh, no, I, I do not intend to um, represent the whole gay scene or the whole gay BDSM scene even, et cetera. But uh, uh, I do think that the sexuality is so uh, multidirectional. It's so unprecedented sexuality at, at times. And, uh, or, and sexuality is so dynamic, I would say, that uh, even uh, this uh, homophobic uh, film, in my eyes, uh, could not escape the joy of, of gay sex, the joy of gay sex, as uh, Gold, Goldstein, I think. Uh, Silverstein wrote a book called uh, The Joy of, of Gay Sex. So uh, it's about uh, joyfulness, and this joyfulness somehow, uh, 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 I think, um, transgresses the homophobic uh, framework of this film. And uh, I certainly agree with you, certainly agree that uh, um, uh, even uh, in uh, this uh, homophobic uh, sphere, there are certain uh, enclaves of, uh, of uh, sincere enjoyment. And uh, this uh, joyfulness is transgressive and it even escaped the uh, homophobic framework. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So um, thank you for that, Gilad. It's really fascinating. And But we have to move on now to our final paper. Um, we have two speakers who have got up very early this morning to be with us here. Um, so thank you very much, both of you. Uh, Gary Gow and Jennifer Quist from Alberta University are going to talk about a dildonic assemblage, the paradox of masculinity, desire and queerness on Chinese re reality televisions. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pronounce it. It'll just be mangled and I, I'm ashamed that I'm not going to pronounce it. I've been practicing <laughs> and now I'm too scared to do it. So. Uh, I'll pass over to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Clarissa. Thank you. <clears throat> so in 2020, Hunan TV launched a sports game show called Yundong Ba Xiang Nian. Um, uh, Jennifer, which was, uh, yes? would you like to share the screen now? I thought you were sharing the screen. <laughs> oh, sorry. I would do it right now. Sorry about uh, it. Yes, like there you said, you it's, it's, it's it's very early <laughs> in Canada right now, Western Canada. All right, so it was called Yunong Bao Shang Yan, which the network unfortunately translated as let's exercise boys. And, and uh, Wang Taolua and I would have preferred um, game on bro, which is more in the, the spirit that they intended in the first place, but nobody asked us. So on the program, Young, attractive, fit men compete in head-to-head -head competitions of speed, power, agility, and audience popularity. Its format was a deliberate departure from reality TV competitions based on singing and dancing. And it was meant to distance young Chinese men from the beautiful but effeminate, um, uh, my Chinese early one, Hua Meinan, flower boy media image, which is you know, associated with um, a lot of the, the exports we get from that region. This shift was calculated to achieve two chief objectives explained by the director and producer Li Chao. The first was to cater to underserved emerging markets arising from new trends towards personal fitness in contemporary China. The second was to reimagine youthful Chinese male masculinity. With the second objective, Undong Ba Xiang Yan entered the cultural space of fitness poised to influence not only aesthetic preferences, but ethics and ideals. 
Of the cast, producer Lee says, we need this group of young, sunny athletes to show audiences another type of youthful disposition to launch a new image of a new generation of Chinese youth. And sure enough, state-owned media outlets praise the show for its positivity and for its redirection of young male masculinity away from um, androgynous idol models and toward traditional Chinese Wu masculinity. However, this official heteronormative nationalistic rhetoric is only one of the show's faces. Another is visible in its promotional spots, which are marked not by uh, producer Chow's uh, fresh sunny faces, but by depersonalized bare torsos and smoldering sexual glares. Along with the show comes the spectacle characterized by British pop culture journalist Mark Simpson in 2014 as spornosexuality. Spornosexual subjects are celebrated for fitness and physical conditioning. They dress, undress, pose, and photograph themselves to attract and to gratify a social media following. Spornosexual images tend to be hypersexualized and read as homoprovocative images of male masculinity appealing to masculine um, queer desire. Through the study of the spornosexuality of Injongba Xiaonian, we argue that this show operates with a de facto transformative queer core. It constitutes what we will call hereafter a dildonic assemblage. Elaborating on the work of Deleuze and Guattari and Paul B. Precchiato, we describe an assemblage which is a machine of desire, a collective enunciation, and a sexual body's assisted cultural technology of modification, which can elicit a multiplicity of pleasures, male, female, and gender queer. Ultimately, and ironically, uh, the show subverts and complicates the heteronormative official national discourse that would suppress it through this new spornosexual iteration of Chinese male masculinity. Um, yeah, here's our next slide. We pose the questions, what changes in Chinese ideals of masculinity does Yun Bao Xiaonian ostensibly promote? How do viewers use the show's paratext and subtext to provoke gay tongzhi discourses about fantasy and desire in an age of increasingly strict censorship? And how does the range of audience responses correspond to the contestation of the spornosexual masculine heartthrobs of the show with the androgynous idols of other East Asian media? After exploring the contradictions in its representations of masculinity, desire, and queerness, we can then contend that Undong Ba Xiaonian highlights ambivalent attitudes towards homoeroticism and an ironic queering of male bodies within Chinese media. In 2011, China's National Radio and Television Administration issued general rules for television series content production to further, quote, a wholesome diet of patriotic propaganda that would glorify the party. So these general rules um, prohibit displays of homosexuality on television, um, a stance that was strengthened by a very recent announcement of even stricter limitations on effeminate male roles and persons on Chinese media. Officially, China remains culturally and politically at odds with gay content, a position springing from neo-Confucian heteronormativity, as well as from the Chinese Communist Party's insistence that social stability is best preserved within traditional family structures. This is not to say that Chinese censorship of queer content is well-conceived or consistent, quite the contrary. Depictions of Chinese government operations as perfectly centralized and coordinated tend to be nothing but ominous myths told by outsiders. In daily reality, there is no single ever consistent subject which can be isolated as the Chinese censor. What we have instead are scattered ad hoc sensorial reactions of either raising or rationalizing queer content and media. Unintentionally, the scramble to regulate Chinese media and non-normative masculinities on Chinese TV, including spornosexuality, triggers constructive discourse on gayness and gender among audiences. And it may paradoxically be rehabilitative, especially as the notice, notion of assemblages takes on the transformative characteristics of the dildonic. During the show's opening monologue, a masculine voiceover narrator set up, sets up the central metaphor. It is a call for 刺破, 
literally a puncturing. Figuratively, this is the penetration of the gaze of contemporary um, Chinese TV audiences with something unconventional, both in terms of the sports game show format and in the show's representation of this new spornosexual masculinity. We connect this penetration to Precchiato's analogy of the dildo, a theoretical device particularly well-suited to questions of gender, sexuality, and power. Precchiato's deconstruction of the English word dildo leads to two recurring connotations, delight and pleasure and male effeminacy. From there, he argues that the dildo can operate as a commanding analogy, it's more than a technology of sexual pleasure. It is both power and desire held in a paradoxical dynamic. By synthesizing the work of Deleuze and Guattari and Precchiato to form the concept of the dildonic assemblage, we arrive at an idea which is both constructive and contradictory, resexualizing while reinforcing existing conservative norms. Like other assemblages, the dildonic assemblage entails heterogeneous composition and constructive mechanisms. It both contributes excuse me, it both contributes to the search for pleasure knowledge while consolidating a normative sexual regime. Precchiato's concept of the dildo reveals the supplemental constructedness of gender and sexuality, which in turn exposes and enables the plasticity of the body. Applied to masculinity on Chinese TV, Precchiato's dildo analogy combined with the idea of assemblages exposes and enables the plasticity of Chinese culture, not in spite of censorship, but through that very censorship. Go ahead, Gary. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for doing the heavy lifting to explain the theory. And uh, I'll you know, give you some fun examples from here. There you go. Yun Dong Ba Shao Nian, YS, hereafter. Yun Dong Ba Shao Nian's celebration of the sexualized athletic male body perpetuates and amplifies consumerist discourse about body work and the social and erotic capital associated with it. Among YS's 33 contestants, those with bulkier athletic physiques receive more screen time than the live trim bodies of flower boy contestants. One such contestant is Chiu Yi Wei, who immediately garnered popularity in the pilot episode for his well-built body, beard, and dry quick wit. Close-ups of Cho glut the show's footage and render his physique into an media commodity which functions as a semiotic symbol to index sexual ideals and showmanship in post-socialist China. The GIF on this slide illustrates an instant in, a, in episode one when Cho is briefly shirtless, preparing for competition while the show's Sorry, while the rest of the cast is fully dressed. The image is fleeting, but captured and drawn out in the show's final edit. It is a moment of mediatizational objectification, which frames and sexualizes his body. Cho is lit to highlight his chest and deltoid muscles, transforming them into embodiments of phallic potency. This image supplants his personality with a constructed persona, a spornosexualized body presented as a vector of sensual and sexual pleasure. This reification of the bodies of YS contestants is further established with a comment captured on a contestant's hot mic. The commenter was Xu Zhibing, a flower boy type contestant who witnessed the moment of Chiu Sung dress and observed, as you can see in the GIF, it will attract lots of fans. Aware of the camera, Cho averts his eyes, offering the floating gaze, which according to sociologist Irvin Goffman, is a gender display traditionally associated with women modeling in advertisements. Turning the gaze from the camera is known as license withdrawal, and it creates an impression that the model is disoriented in a social situation and responding by withdrawing from viewers. The gift captures the precise moment when Cho looks away, leaving the image of his body exposed to inspection and consumption by viewers. The to be looked aptness of the display is attributed to the male body, catering to the sensual and sexual desires of contemporary Chinese women 
and of gay men. Each of these groups is growing uh, both in their purchasing power and in their power to articulate and advocate for their own needs and desires. They are a market to be served. In this sense, Cho and the rest of the sexualized subjects of YS become a late motif of a sexual and a queer spectacle. Oh, my bad. Now, as we all know, TV fans are always a crucial part in the media poly system. In this second example, I will show you how gay fans of YS created alternative paratext to question the dominant sexual value system, querying the show's bonosexualized contestants. Those fanish discourses serve as a didonic supplement, an étranger that is paradoxically the reflection and refraction of a mass produced text. For example, a few days before Yin Dong Bashanian premiered, fan produced articles that offer a queer reading of the show's paratext. For example, its logos, catchphrases, and posters appeared on a Chinese website and were rapidly circulated to other digital and online platforms. Commenters jokingly argued that the series would be a visual feast for gays in China based on its promos and its featuring of homoerotic elements. Now you may read two snippets here. Neither author explains how these signs correspond to gay subculture in China, but the queer sensitive audience will understand their homoerotic associations immediately. The Arabic number one is a Chinese euphemism for top, while the letter S stands for the Chinese character show, which is an equivalent of the English gay jargon, bottom. Rightly or wrongly, both commenters believed YS was engaged in queer baiting. During the pre-premiere days, when those comments on YS's promotions were posted, the burgeoning YS gay fandom appears to have been in the early stages of a queer baiting process, somewhere between having their attention engaged by the show and having their enthusiasm for queer readings of the show encouraged, let alone by ambiguously queer references in the promotional Im imagery. These fans had not yet reached the point in queer baiting when, quote, fans feel misled by content creators regarding what to expect in terms of LGBTQ characters and narrative, end quote. It seems that such a deception was never intended. In a June 2020 press release on who9tv.com, the network explains that in the context of YS, the Arabic number one actually symbolizes the spirit of achieving the best results. And the letter S stands for the qualities of sunshine, solidarity, oh, sorry, solidity, speed, strength, sensitivity, demeanor, and supremacy. Taking this press release at face value, the promotional images were not intended as markers and signs directed and the diacritical frontiers between genders and sexuality. So I guess it's time for conclusion. Ring Dong Baishaonia may succeed in a stated mission of reconfiguring the traditional Wu masculinity rejected by the rising generation of Chinese men while penetrating pop culture androgyny, challenging it with a brotherhood of well-groomed athletic masculinity more along party lines. This has not, however, excluded gay readings of the show. In spite of the production team's post hoc explanations of their intentions, the show provokes gay readings, and eventually its pornosexual athletic and narrative converge with them. This may be the point. As the dildonic assemblage works, it reveals that the lines of these Chinese masculinities the traditional Wu, the endogenous idol, and the sponosexual are not discreet. There are no hard demarcations. Masculinity is rather a milieu without a beginning or end, a rhizome. The dildonic assemblage has epistemological value in articulating this. And on behalf of Jennifer and myself, thank you, Messi and Cecilia. Thank you. Oh, have I? 
unmuted myself. Yes, I have. Thank you very much. That was really fascinating, um, particularly uh, to see something that, you know, um, I, I wouldn't normally have access to or and to hear it discussed in those ways. Do we have any questions for our two speakers, please? I'm just going to look to see if I can see anyone with their hand up. No one? I don't want to cut in before anybody else. Oh yes, uh, do I see a hand up? I'm just looking on here. It's a bit difficult to, to see. Oh, Gilad, did you Hi. want to come in? Hi, please do, Hi. thank you. Uh, I wonder about, I think it's very, very interesting. Uh, this research is very important. Um, I'm very much interested in the uh, homoerotic subtleties, although it's not so subtle, actually, it is uh, very homoerotic. Uh, these uh, these uh, Chinese uh, screens are very homoerotic. Um, I wonder about the um, politics of these uh, bodies, uh, like in, in, in several aspects. Uh, um, maybe uh, I, I'm just making a hypothesis. I'm not sure, but maybe um, it's something transgressive, even in political terms. Um, this uh, celebration of uh, of the male body and uh, exhibiting and consuming and objectifying the male body in this way, um, there has a sort of uh, a, even a protest against the uh, social collectivism and uh, a cry for uh, uh, new trends or unorthodox trends in a way. Uh, uh, it's a sort of um, uh, maybe uh, even westernization of uh, of uh, Chinese culture in a way. Well, maybe I'm going too far. I'm not sure. You can read it. It's a sort of uh, protest. Uh, this new aesthetics. Uh, sorry, I was asking if uh, if this. Um, um, images, uh, very uh, uh, sexy images of a uh, Chinese man on screen. Uh, is it a sort of maybe a protest against uh, the social collectivism, against uh, the orthodox thinking, and uh, uh, is it is it a sort of yearning for uh, Westernization or gayification? of uh, Chinese masculinity, or maybe I'm going too far. Gary, you want to do that one? Or you want me to do Well, it? between the two of us, you are the more eloquent one, so go ahead. Well, you're the Chinese man, though. So. <laughs> 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 A little bit authoritative here, go ahead. Um, well, I, brotherhood is something that's emphasized over and over again here. and. Um, it's not like a survivor physical game show, the American program survivor, where there is just uh, alliances between individuals and, and the teams kind of break down eventually and stuff. Um, it is head to head competition, like I said, but sportsmanship and teams and these um, team leaders who are on the show constantly providing a nationalistic framework for the teams to to relate to each other and like they they choose um former olympic champions um you, you may remember um the the swimmer who won a gold medal in the backstroke and in her interview with the western media said yeah she didn't think her chances were very good because she was on her period you know these kind of people were the celebrities who were, were leading it so it has all through this this very celebratory um, power of China um, feel to it. And sometimes the what we might read as individualistic in the West is uh, in a Chinese context text more like a, a parade of tanks or something, you know, like this is this is how strong and virile our rising generation is. And in that way it's, it's extremely collective. And 
Interestingly, it's the sexual reading where it becomes more individualistic in, in, in my take. What do you think, Gary? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And um, I just want to comment on the, the, the use of the term brotherhood. Um, but it, it, in, well, my comment may be off on a tangent. Um, the, 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 the idea of socialist brotherhood was actually original, uh, well, or, originally used by a group of, um, you know, female or gay fans to defend the homoerotic or, you know, homosexual representations on another Chinese TV show because they wanted to sh they want to show the censors that this is this was not homoerotic. This was considered as brotherhood. And um, I think somehow uh, here, whether intentionally or not, the production team tried to, you know, aim, try to aim for that image of brotherhood there to tell the censors so to let the, um, you know, the authorities up there know, okay, we are emphasizing what the party is promoting, you know, the, um, the, 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 the social collectivism, the, um, the collaboration, you know, qualities like that. So yeah, that's just my <laughs> comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else wants to ask a, a question? Lisa, do I see your hand up? Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, thank you for a very interesting um, uh, paper. Um, I wanted to, to uh, ask for a further elaboration of the um, semiotics of the one and the S. Um, I want some more subtext uh, on that because I, I thought this is really ironic and, and fascinating basically. So, um, you know, us in the West need a, a, a bit more uh, background. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, I think I can take this question because it has something to do with translation, which is my research field. Um, yeah, why? Well, one is a commonly used gay jargon, you know, among uh, you know, in the Chinese queer community, especially for the gays. Um, well, it, it just resembles the shape of the phallus, <laughs> the, the shape of, um, you know, the, the penis. And uh, and that has association with being top because you are the, you know, a more active, uh, active uh, part in a relationship. And for us, um, I would say the queer reading is a little bit, well, it doesn't really well. The 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 the, the homoerotic association is not that strong as uh, as the number one because as the uh, apparently the commenter, you know, I guess he made a campy comment saying, "Okay, the S stands for show," uh, which happened to be a, a gay jargon, you know, um, used in the Chinese community as well. But um, I would say this is. Um, it's um and this is you know less apparent for 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 the general audience even for the gay gay audience so yeah so, and also jennifer um yeah jennifer made a comment this is what the show character looks like it means just you are show means you are on the receiving end Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I can see that. But um, just uh, one final question. One yeah. would go for uh, heteronormative uh, masculinity as well. I mean, why is it appropriated? How common it, it is appropriated by, uh, you know, gay masculinity? And why hasn't uh, uh, heteronormative masculinity claimed it? I mean, one would work for both. What? How come? Hmm. And yeah. Good question. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't have an answer to that question. I should look into it. I've, actually, I've never thought of it, thought of it because as a gay person, I'm, I'm very familiar with these and I, I never look into the origin of, of, of the appropriation. So sorry. Well, perhaps it is a first come first serve thing. So, you know, whoever, you know, thought of it first, you know, sort of claimed the, the semiotics of it so it could be you know random basically yeah that yeah that could be the reason and i think there might be a pop culture reference to it um i i will look into that 
definitely. But thank you. Okay, well, um, we have overrun a tiny bit, not by much, but uh, I, I need to um, bring us to a close now. Thank you very much for the fantastic um, papers that we've had today. Um, been really interesting and we've ranged across uh, various dimensions of representations of um, masculinity. I'm conscious that everybody needs to have a break before at two o'clock there's our artist talk with Richard Sword and Smith. Um, so thank you so much to our speakers. That's been really fascinating this morning and uh, well, this afternoon actually it is here and uh, morning for Gary and Jennifer. Uh, but thank you and we'll see you at two. Thanks a lot. Bye.